Our next speaker is Gary McHale. He created CaledoniaWakeUpCall.com in 2006 and then formed the Canadian Advocates for Charter Equality in 2007. He has, he, has, sorry, he has been interviewed more than 700 times and has been featured nationally by the CBC, National Post, Globe and Mail, as well as conducting interviews with radio and print journalists from almost every province in Canada. Gary has authored The Cost of Native Occupations and co-authored Legalized Myths of Illegal Occupations and the Human Cost of Illegal Occupations. These reports have been downloaded more than 86,000 times. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. The title of my presentation is The Face of Aboriginal Sovereignty versus the Rule of Law in Caledonia. I'm sure most people in this room are not aware of the events that took place in Caledonia other than a few news stories. My PowerPoint presentation will try to inform you of some of the things that have taken place and my oral presentation will try to deal with the issue of the rule of law. On January 30th, 1649, Oliver Cromwell had King Charles beheaded, proving a fundamental legal concept that no one is above the law. Gone are the days when the people are not gone were the days when people were not subject to law because of their bloodline or because of their status within society. No longer did the McHale clan do battle with the McGregor clan to force their views of law and order upon each other. There was a time when individual noblemen uh, could punish members of a family or entire towns just by a decision they, they met. It didn't matter what the law said. It only mattered that they were above the law. Today, whether you're the Prime Minister of Canada or the person on the street, the rule of law means that you are equally subject to law and equally protected by the law. Throughout the world, whenever people have been victimized by the state, the solution has been to establish the rule of law. For example, the systematic killing of Jewish people by Nazi Germany has not produced a group of people who see all Germans as evil or that Germany needs to be attacked. For 60 years, we have witnessed the Jewish people respecting the rule of law, seeking to uh, prosecute Nazis, not persecute Germans. We have never seen examples of, of Jewish people wearing masks, carrying baseball bats, attacking German people in the streets. Justice and the rule of law go hand in hand to ensure that people can live peacefully amongst each other. We live by the rule of law. We do not live by the rule of thugs. The rule of law in the United Nations. The idea of the rule of law is not something that's Canadian. It's not even British. It's something that the United Nations itself endorses. I'll give you a quote. On the UN website for the rule of law says, We're promoting the rule of law at the national and international level is at the heart of the UN mission. Establishing respect for the law is fundamental to achieving a durable peace in the aftermath of conflict, to effectively pr protecting human rights, to sustaining economic growth and development, the principle that everyone, from the individual up to the state itself, is accountable to the law, uh, that are publicly propagated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated is a fundamental concept that drives much of the United Nations work. The rule of law ensures that individuals don't interpret the law themselves, that they don't take the law into their own hand. You allow an independent adjudicator to make decisions on the rule of law. In 2007, the United Nations has a Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Article number three says the following. Indigenous people have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they, are free, they can freely determine their political status, freely pursue their economic and social, uh, cultural and social development. However, in the preamble of that declaration, they say indigenous people are equal to all other people. It's equality. They're not above, they're not below. The role of the government is to ensure that all people are treated equal under the law. They also affirm in the same declaration that all doctrines, policies, or practices based on advocating the superiority of any person or group 
or based on our national origin is racist, uh, is scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable, and socially unjust. Any view that Aboriginal traditions, culture, spirituality, or any view that white culture, traditions, or spirituality is superior to the other by the UN's own declaration is racist. Therefore, the UN recognizes that we are to treat people equal, equal under the law, equal before the state. The same UN also declares that Aboriginal people are citizens of the state by where they live. The Canadian Constitution upholds these very same principles. The preamble to the Canadian Constitution says, whereas Canada is founded on the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Section 35 of the Constitution states, the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Aboriginal people of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. The courts have ruled on this, what the interpretation of this section of, of uh, the Charter means, or the Constitution means. The rule of law means that I as an individual don't look at the law and say, I'm going to determine what it means for me, and my neighbor determines what it means for him. It means that independent judges look at the law and make interpretations. And the Supreme Canada Court has already ruled that Section 35, which, which affirms treaty rights of, of Aboriginal people, says, states the following, here's a quote, Section 35 clearly refers to protection of Indian rights as of April 17, 1982. The insertion of the word existing can only be understood to be deliberately meaning that it started as of 1982. It's not my constitution, it's not my interpretation, but they go on to say that the, that section of the constitution was not meant to turn back 200 years of history but in actual fact was to ensure that whatever rights natives had protected under the government, whatever treaties were signed or will, will be signed, will be recognized by the Canadian government. Furthermore, the Charter of Rights uh, states, Section 15, every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, in particular discrimination against race, nationality, origin or color, sexual orientation. Are we going to believe that all people are equal under the law? Are we going to say that all people are subject to the law? Because it says there, you are equal, have a right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law. Section 27 of the same charter says, this charter shall be interpreted in a manner consistent with preservation and enhancement of a multicultural heritage of Canadians. It has been said that uh, Aboriginal people are not subject to the criminal code. In actual fact, this, this issue has been addressed by every single provincial court, been addressed by every superior court in the province, in every province, and has been addressed by the Supreme Court of Canada itself. In one case, I'll quote from R versus David. In 2000, it says, here's the statement, Mr. David claims essentially a, a claim for full Aboriginal Mohawk sovereignty is not a novel one. It has been proposed, that has been considered by Canadian courts on numerous occasions. It has never been accepted and I am certainly bound to reject it as well. Canadian sovereignty is a legal reality recognized by the law of nations. Claims as such has been advocated in this case by Mr. David does not make that reality less real. Supreme Court has upheld that, that view of uh, Canada's sovereign and that uh, uh, the criminal code applies to, to all people. There's an inherent problem in the view of some of the people, protesters from Six Nations. Their argument is that they're a separate sovereign nation. Well, that doesn't change the argument whether they're subject to the criminal code because an American comes up to Canada he still, if he commits a crime, can be arrested and prosecuted under the Canadian court system. So being a sovereign nation doesn't change whether or not you can be prosecuted under the criminal code. If a Canadian goes down to the United States and commits a crime, he's not prosecuted in Canada. He's prosecuted in the United States. That's inherent in international law. So there are some who argue that the Holloman Tract, which includes Caledonia, is not Canadian soil. So therefore, crimes committed by Six Nations people on, in the Holloman Tract cannot be subject to the criminal code because it's not Canadian soil. Well, if we hold that view to be true, 
then it applies both ways. If a Canadian is not on Canadian soil, he can't be prosecuted for committing a criminal act. So if a native person can wear a mask, carry a baseball bat, and beat somebody up in the Haldeman track because it's not subject to the criminal code, then what prevents a person who says, I've had enough, I too am going to take a bat and beat up a native person? He can't be prosecuted by their logic, not by my logic, by their logic, he can't be prosecuted because it's not Canadian soil. And so we have an inherent problem here because all we're going to have is a group of thugs duking it out in the streets, which has happened. There's been riots in Caledonia. There's been people duking it out. There's been officers injured, a guy with brain damage. Uh, so these, these kind of situations have taken place. But if you're going to advocate a logic that says that in that particular stretch of land, the criminal code does not apply, then it doesn't apply to anyone, regardless of your race, because the law has to be equal for everybody. The rule of law in Caledonia has been already ruled on many times in the various court rulings. The Ontario Court of Appeal overturned a rule by Judge Marshall, which the natives are boast about, because Judge Marshall had ruled uh, about this particular land that uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't occupy it. But the same Ontario Court Appeal ruling states the following. If the protesters cause any nuisance or any other disturbance affecting neighboring land or residents of Caledonia, then action may be required. I accept, this is the court saying, I accept that negotiations are not a substitution for individual responsibility for criminal acts. In another court ruling by Superior Court Judge Henderson, he says, I find the actions of the Honosoni Men's Fire amounts to both criminal and civil misconduct. Their actions have interfered with the property rights of the Vortmans and, have caused, and can be characterized as nuisance, trespassing, extortion, and intimidation. He then further goes on to say the following about the rule of law. Before I conclude, I'd like to emphasize the rule of law. All people in Canada are governed by the rule of law as confirmed in the preamble to the Charter of Rights and Freedom. That is, all people in Canada are required to obey the law. All people in Canada are entitled to know that every other person in Canada is required to obey the law. If any person in Canada does not obey the law, the courts will enforce that law. In that way, the public can have some assurance that they can live in peace without fear of those who might choose to break the law. In closing, I'd like to uh, point out that within my lifespan, I was born in the early 60s, we have witnessed the civil rights movement in the states going from where blacks could be lynched to a black man being the president of the United States. Generations of abuse by the state and by the white public uh, came to a head in the 50s and 60s. Blacks had to come to a conclusion of how they were going to gain their rights. Malcolm X called for an armed revolution to overthrow the evil white man. Martin Luther King had a dream of equality where one day a person would be, not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, where the truth was self-evident that all men were created equal. The only people who roamed the streets at that time with their faces covered and committing violence were the members of the KKK, and Dr. King was not about to go follow in their footsteps. Dr. King respected the rule of law, which is why he demanded protection by the law. The fruits of Dr. King's approach to the historical injustice lifted black people up to the point where one, now one is the President of the United States. The United Nations believes in the rule of law is vital to peace, and the Aboriginals in Canada have to make a decision on what path they're going to take. They're faced with the exact, exact, exact same dilemma as black people in the States. There has been a historical wrong. But you can choose violence, or you can choose peaceful means. And the rule of law is not just there to protect non-native people. Because a day may come when a group of non-native people make a decision that they're going to systematically attack and abuse native people. What are the native people to say then? Are they to cry out and say the rule of law doesn't apply? Or are they going to cry out to society and say, come and enforce the law and protect us? That's what the rule of law does. It protects you, it protects me, it protects them. And as a society, we have to choose peace in the rule of law because the only other option is crime and violence. Thank you.